hi everybody. <laughs> um, I, I, he's blindsided me. When I mean, we're sitting here talking, I didn't know what he wanted me to testify about. But uh, <laughs> I don't remember the one you're talking about. <laughs> So um, we went to, with some friends, I went to Our Lady of the Snows to see the lights. You know, they've got all those Christmas lights out, and we had dinner. And um, they have a wonderful buffet. If you haven't been there, go, because the food is great. And so when we walked in, there was a woman standing kind of at a podium. And um, I knew she was an employee, but she had some friends around her that she was talking to, you know, kind of... You could tell they were personal. And when I saw her, the Lord told me there is something wrong with her shoulder. She's in a lot of pain. And I wanted to stop and pray for her. And I thought, no, she's with her friends. I don't want to interrupt them. So we went to the table. And the first thing I said to my friends that were there was, I wanted to pray for that lady. There is something wrong with her shoulder. And boom, she walked up to our table. I'm going like, whoa, okay, and she started with whatever, I think she came to bring menus or something, and I said, do you have something wrong with your shoulder, and at first she said no, and then she gets this look on her face, she said, well, yeah, but it's in the back of my shoulder, um, and I asked her what was wrong, she said, I don't know, but it's very, very painful or something like that, and I said, well, can I pray for you? And she said, yeah, okay. So we're in the middle of the dining room <laughs> at this point. So I got out of my chair and I said, well, can you just sit down here? I just didn't have a catcher. I was kind of concerned about laying hands on her there. And so she sat down in my chair and I stood behind her and laid hands on her. And she was completely, totally healed and pain free. It was awesome. Yeah. And she stood up and, and just thanked me profusely for, for stepping out and doing that. And when we left, I stopped. She was at, in the front um, behind a desk, different desk than the first time. But I stopped and I asked her, while Denise and the others wanted to ride camels, <laughs> I didn't think that was a good plan for me. And um, I asked her how she was feeling. How was her shoulder? She said, I am totally pain-free. And she said, you came here tonight for this. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to say, she was the first person I think I've ever prayed for who immediately, stand, she stood up in the middle of this restaurant, and she, prays, she prayed out loud in the dining room. Yeah, and she crossed herself. <laughs> Never had anyone do that before either. But um, she obviously totally was very thankful and thanked God for it. So that is awesome, too. So Denise was riding a camel. That is... Okay. Isn't that beautiful, though? I love that she began to praise God right in the middle of it all. And um, I just wanted you to share that just because uh, this is a wonderful way. Now, that happened last year, which is great. So just can't wait for what God has in store this year, right? But um, it's, it's incredible knowing that, um, that the power of God is available to those who believe. And, and uh, Donna always has a, a way of her lifestyle living a way that makes me proud, for sure. So thank you. Isn't that good, guys? Come on. Now, a lot of times at the beginning of a year, as a pastor, you give that January State of the Union type of address for the year. But unfortunately, I started that last week. So if you weren't here last week, you missed it. So I don't know, sorry, but we're not going to necessarily do it exactly just that way. Although I am going to share some of the things, um, but just not all of them. And uh, we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46 and verse... Nine. 
one thing I want to make clear that I believe with all my heart that this is a year of joy that we'll be coming into. This is a year of, of joy, of what's been spoken to my heart. We started declaring last week. And um, there's so much encompassed just around that. And I don't know if you've lived long enough, but sometimes that's a testimony in itself to be someone uh, going through life and to have joy in their life, even Christians, even believers. And it's not even necessarily how you start. Maybe you didn't get the best start, but it's not on how you start, but it's definitely on how you finish this life. And I don't know what you went through in this past year. Maybe it was a great year, but if not, um, I just want to encourage you that this is a new year, regardless of last year, um, that, that I'm ready to walk into and to receive a year of the joy that God has for us here in this year. And, and the great thing about God is He knows the end from the beginning. And that's good news. I don't know how you like watching movies. I don't want to know how the end happens. <laughs> Everybody has their own personality. Um, you might be married to the spouse that asks you the whole time what's going to happen, as if you would know, even though you guys are both watching it for the first time. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't want to know. I, <laughs> I don't want to know. I want to, I guess I want to experience it in the moment. Now, when it comes to life, I do want to know. I mean, it's completely different. Uh, you know, we went from point A to point Z, right? We want it mapped out. God, what's going on? What do you have planned? And, and I don't want to say that's never the case, but it's very rarely the case. Yeah. I can remember, <laughs> see, Lord of the Rings, uh, this was years ago. And, and one of my favorite movies is Lord of the Rings. And um, most of the world had read the books. The smart people read the books, me growing up, I was not one of the smart ones. <laughs> Have you seen the size of those books? I mean, come on. Who's going to read that? And so I had no clue what I was walking into when I went into that theater. And if you ever got to see the movie, I'm not condoning it. Do not go see it and you know, ask your parents' permission. But uh, anyways, it's awesome. Uh, so I'm sitting in that theater, and I'm watching And when it got to the end, as you know, it like leaves you hanging. Never in my life had I been to a movie to where they did that and they did not finish the story and they just stopped. I can't tell you how mad, upset, I, this was wrong. I paid what? I, this is, it was such an incredible, now, now mind you, I'm one of the weird, like I had tears. In that movie, like, like I'm sitting there blown away because, you know, I felt God was speaking to me on some things in that movie. But when it came to the end and they just cut it off, I had no clue because I didn't read the books, you know. I didn't know. So good thing is we do get to read the book, so we get some hints on how this story ends. And, and we know the ending of, of the story, and we know that we win. I said we know that we win. Yeah, why? Because we've read the end of the book and we know the end. And that's fantastic, but sometimes along the way, I don't feel like I'm winning. You know, sometimes I'm going through some things. I'm like, God, I didn't know this was a part of that promise you told me. Or, I didn't think that was that plan. Or, God, how can this happen to me in my life? Or, how could this go on like this? And there's a lot of things that come up and arise, um, and, and we don't know. But we do know this, that God does know the end from the beginning. And he declares things to us with the end in mind, and he knows. And so if you're in the middle of something right now, don't, don't be upset. We know that it's not the end of our story. That means we've got another page to turn. There's another chapter in the story of mine. And maybe I don't like the story that I'm in right now, but I'm not giving up hope. I'm not giving up throwing in the towel. I just know that there's going to be another page to turn. And so with this, we're going to read Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. I love it. So all that, just for that, he declares the end from the beginning. So as we launch off, I just, I want you to know, for, for me, um, I want to I start off with the end in mind. 
Does that make sense? That's why when we're in, in the transition after worship service, this is how we want to end this year, with a praise coming from our lips, with this praise of testimony in my heart. God, I'm giving it to you. Because a lot of people start off at the beginning of the year with good aspirations, right? You're going to the gym for one day. You know, you're going and you're eating right and, and you're making all these choices. And it kind of can bleed over into our walk with God. We start off right, and I'm glad for starting off right. But even more is not just how we start, but it's how we finish. So with the end in mind, what I look at, now as we close that last year, I was so happy as we were declaring, uh, be the answers, what we're ministering on. We're not just people that come to church. We're just not a people that come and, and sit in and listen to sermons and go home, and, and that's all we do. But actually, um, instead of looking around in our life, it doesn't take long to look around and see problems in the world, look and see some issues going on. It's easy for us to stand a point or post something on Facebook, our opinion of what we think in a situation. But instead of sitting here looking and asking questions, that we're going to become the answer. We're not just even going to sit there. We're going to say, you know what? We see a question. We're going, to, we're going to see, asking God, what is this answer? And let's become the answer. And as we minister on being the answer, so many ministries rising up of people standing up and say, I want to be a part of Be the Answer. And I was so proud of watching everybody just stand up, being a part, helping out, volunteering in some way at church, being a part of one of our outreaches. And even many of our outreaches began to start and being birthed out of Be the Answer answer and we have a lot of things that are going on and I'm so excited about that and I know it's as if we started in the fall and the close of last year so that that we could start this year that we could hit the ground running I don't have to minister and speak and teach and and try to lay out the plans of be the answer we're already rolling in that direction so that's exciting to me and I'm believing in this year that we do more this year than we've ever done before yeah we're still gonna do missions trips we're still have a global vision we're still doing mission trips we're ministering to nations from around the world but then we're also obviously ministering in our backyard we're ministering in our streets and our neighborhoods even Our Lady of the Snow. We, uh, we, we can minister uh, wherever we are. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to find that. And, and so I know that as we dealt with on last Sunday, I had two people stand up. One of those was joy and the other one was hope. Because there was something prophetically even in regards to how the two are combined. That in order to have jo uh, joy in our life, it's an extension of hope. Uh, we have to have hope in our life. And that's why the enemy likes to attack us in ways to steal our hope, to, to, to help uh, us fall into the deceit of a lie that things will never work out. Uh, how, are, how are things ever going to work out with, with all this? How can I ever be happy again? You look at other people and you see them happy or, or you see them and you just maybe have questions on how that's going to work out uh, in, in my life. But regardless of what the enemies try to feed you uh, of the lies, I'm here to let you know this morning that the devil, that the enemy is a liar. The de I said the devil is a liar. And in spite of what you've been through or what you're going through, I declare to you that this is a year of joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. And one of the great things about joy, it goes beyond happiness. I'm not just talking about happiness. Because there's things, right? The American dream, we think, will make us happy, right? The picket fence uh, around the house, we think that that will make us happy. Until those that get married and they have the picket fence and realize there might be a little something more to this happiness thing than what I originally imagined. You got to cut that grass. You have to paint the fence. <laughs> and then you realize there's more than the house, maybe more than the Bentley. Because we've all been there when we thought the Bentley would make us happy, right? And you find yourself at a place in this coming year. Paul is getting ready to go to the place he's not, he's been warned, he knows it's dangerous. Apostle Paul, on his journey, going back to the place that almost seems 
like a death sentence. He's talking to the disciples and to the church because they're trying to obviously help give him wisdom, I'm sure. But in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he says, But none of these things move me. Neither count I myself dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. I'm talking about actually, I'm talking Christian folk happy. People going to church with joy. He says that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I love and received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. See, it's one thing. Now, look, we've talked about it. We'll be really happy on the day when we finish, uh, that we go across the finish line. Some we, we can imagine will be crawling across that line. And we're all going to be happy just for the fact that we make it. But that's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about that when we finish this race that God has brought, that we are a part of right now, that we're all in this race of life, that when I finish it, that I can finish it with joy. That I'm crossing that line with both hands up, right? There may be sweat, but I got a smile on my face. I'm talking about finishing with joy. Joy is something that's beyond happiness, something that this world cannot give. We can be happy, we can have a good day, but the next day always comes. Joy is completely different. Joy is a substance that can only come from heaven. Joy is a part of that thing with inside of our heart that seems to cry out for something that we seem to not have been able to obtain. Joy fills that spot. It's something that nothing in this world can give us. But it's a joy of the Lord, Nehemiah says, that is our strength. I'm talking about this is a year of strength and joy. And I'm going to tell you from my own heart that one of the things that brings me joy is when I see God's plan unfold in my life. When I see God's plan manifested. When I hear Donna speak about I'm out at dinner and all of a sudden God just helps me minister to this person and, and God heals this person just while we're out to eat. Can I tell you what? That brings me joy. When I see the kingdom of heaven unfolding and the glory of God, when we live a life to bring him glory, nothing brings me a greater joy in my life when I know that I can live for something beyond myself, live for a dream greater than the American dream or my own dream. But I can be a part of God's dream. And when I find that happening, I know in my life, man, it's a great day. It's a joyful day. I'm telling you, nothing gets me more excited when I see that happen and when I see the unfolding. And so when God speaks and says it's a year of joy, I know it's going to be a year of God's kingdom advancing, his, his plans and purposes unfolding, and his promises. And this is a thing. Because we receive promises from God. And sometimes those promises take a little longer than what we were intending. Have you ever been believing in a promise to a point where you begin to question the promise? I'll never forget when uh, Kent Henry was here and, and he called out Jeff and Angie sitting back there in this section right here. And, and they had been believing for a baby for years. They had such a desire to have a baby. They had went the expensive route through the doctors of the in vitro and, and it didn't work. And, and uh, you know, when you're believing for something you feel like God has for you and it's not happening and sometimes we try to help, right? But I love it, God. I think that's faith. It's like I'm doing everything I know to do, God, and I know you will do your part. And it didn't happen. They even tried uh, doing an adoption and, and the door was closed on them for the adoption. They had such a desire for a baby and at every turn the door was closed in their face. And it was on a Sunday night when a word came forth of families wanting to have a baby to come up for prayer. And you know what happened? They stood in their seats. You know why? Because sometimes you can believe and hope for something for so long, and someone gives you a promise or a prophetic word, and it brings frustration and disappointment. It comes to that place where you're like, I, I don't want to get my hopes up again. I'd rather just sit in my seat, God, than walk up to that altar. 
I've been there, done that, and I've bought the t-shirt, and nothing changed. And God, I don't want to take another step because sometimes it's too painful to believe, only for your hopes to be let down once again. And they stood there, and it came to a point through much prodding that they got up to that front. And it was only a matter of weeks that what in vitro could not do, and adoption wasn't able to unfold, that they were able to have their first baby that they had been desiring for. Yeah, it's the goodness of God. And, you know, I don't know why. We can't say why it would take years, why it would take so long. We can't have any reasoning that makes sense. All I know is that when God moves, he has a time, and when he moves, it's incredible. But, but there could be a time when we just would rather stay in our seats than step up because we believe for it for so long that even the very thought of it brings pain and tears. That it's easier not to believe than to try to believe and to fail. But this is a year of promises that you've been believing for, some of you for years, that God's bringing forth into our lives. It's a place of joy. It's a place of joy. Joy comes even from the Father. We spoke about last week that it's the Father's pleasure to give us the kingdom. Our Heavenly Father takes pleasure. As, as good parents, it actually brings us pleasure to give something to our kids. It, it, it's it's wonderful because when they're younger, it's so much easier to give them what they want, right? <laughs> when they get older, the toys get a little bit more expensive. Or if a toy breaks, it's easy to go back to the store and buy another one. Judah says, I'm hungry. I can get in the car and go to McDonald's. I mean, cook. <laughs> it's easy. But it gives me joy. And we know scripture says if we be in somewhat the way we are, give good gifts to our children, how much more our Heavenly Father. And specifically speaking about the Holy Spirit, Amen. when we ask for the Holy Spirit, that He's a good gift giver. Amen. He is so good. He actually takes pleasure in it. Sometimes it's hard for us to perceive, to think, to imagine God having pleasure in us. For many different reasons. But because in the Bible we see that he does, beyond our comprehension, he takes pleasure in you and me. And, and maybe we don't understand how it could be. But when I get into finding out who he is in the word of God, and I find this out, it brings, I understand, God, how can I bring you joy? What is it that I can offer a God who has streets of gold? Joy. There's descriptions of angels that are incredible in the Bible. I mean, that would shriek fear into anybody who saw one. And these angels are worshiping him, him around the throne. So what is it about my worship that can bring him pleasure? But it does. It is. And even more than bringing pleasure, he gave his very best for you and me. If he gives something he didn't have many of, like an angel, his only begotten son, he does it because he loves us. And somehow in all this, we find that from Paul, who's going pretty much into a death sentence, says, you know what, don't worry, I don't count myself. Uh, I, I don't find that uh, anything of myself, but I'm finishing my course with joy. If, if I keep my eyes focused upon Jesus in the big picture, it helps me to walk in joy in spite of what I'm going through in that day. Joy. When I find out, according to Psalm 16, that in his presence is fullness of joy, you're not going to have to knock on my door, call me, send me a message um, trying to get me to come back to church because I want to get into his presence because I know there's fullness of joy. Hallelujah. I'm going to spend time with God at home because there's fullness of joy in his presence. 
And so if he declares that this is a year of joy, I'm excited because I'm expecting this is going to be a year of his presence in my life. And I don't know more so than as much as seeing his kingdom manifested, it's his presence in my life that brings me joy. And so if he speaks that there's, there's a year of joy, then I know this is going to be a year of his presence. And that's something I encourage you to be greedy about. Go ahead, be greedy. Go after his presence. You seek him with everything that's with inside of you. And when you've received uh, to your full, ask again and ask for more. And ask for more. This is the lifestyle that we've lived, right? But there's something about the answering of things that brings joy. And it's not even like we're saying, here's Paul finishing. Um, It's so important because we look at another man by the name of David. We have worship conferences named Heart of David Worship Conference. David is still a popular name to this day, right? This is a mighty man of God in Scripture. Uh, the warrior king, the, the greatest advancement of the uh, victories for the kingdom of God under the reign of King David. He was able to conquer every enemy that he faced. He was one that even in his youth, he's taken out giants. Taken out, we're talking about a giant killer. That's who we're talking about. And it's one thing for the prophet Samuel to come or a prophet to speak over your life and say there's a man of God or incredible one, but even a greater testimony. David gets the testimony, not just by a prophet, but by God himself said to Samuel, I have found a man after my own heart. Wow. What a testimony that we strive for. As God, that we have a heart that captures your attention. That we have a life that goes after your heart. To know not just your acts, but God, we want to know your ways. God, it's your heart that is the very thing that I'm after. More than than what you can give me, Lord, if I can know your heart. And David, here he is, this shepherd boy on the backside of a hill where nobody seems to know where he is, but one did. And that's the only one that counts. And that's God. God knows where you're at. God finds you when nobody else sees you, when nobody else seems to know where you are or your address, when your father didn't even call you into the house, when the prophet calls a meeting. God knew where he was. And God said, I found a man. Don't you know God is still looking for men and women that will worship him in spirit and truth when nobody's around to pat you on the back. Someone to say, God, I'm here to worship you. Not because I'm in a church service. Not because I'm asking for a healing. Not because I'm asking for something. But God, just because of who you are, I want to tell you, God, that I love you. Here he is, a shepherd, with all the brothers picking on him. If you're a part of a big family, you can probably relate of the pecking order of the brothers and sisters in a family. And, and, and they, he got the job nobody else wanted. I don't think his future looked so bright. He didn't have a coat of many colors. And yet, little did he know that he found access to the throne of God that would one day give him access to the throne of Israel. Impossible in that day. Kings don't just, uh, weren't elected in that day. Kings weren't something that they voted on. In a kingdom, a king, it comes through the bloodline. Jonathan was next in line to be the king of Israel. But God found a shepherd boy. He knew right where he was. Becomes a giant killer. Writers of psalms that we still sing today. Guys, thousands of years later, after he died, we're singing his songs. He found a doorway to the heart of God. Is it possible that we could live a life that encourages others to access to God's presence. Thousands of years later, David proved it in an Old Testament covenant. (laughs) And yet, we find David in Psalms 51, not after he killed the giant, 
Not after he's dancing for miles because of the Ark of the Covenant has been restored. Not that he's so extravagant in love for God. Somehow, a man that has a heart after God falls into such a place of sin with his adultery with Bathsheba and then trying to cover it up with murder. How does that happen? How does it happen to go from a man after God's own heart to this? And and it's not because of one major thing, one big thing. I believe it was a whole bunch of little things along David's journey. And that the, the affair with Bathsheba wasn't at that place of failure or place of backslidden. That it was only the fruit of the backslidden state that his heart had fallen into long before. Giant killer, adulterer. This point in his life, he wears a throne, a, a, a crown around his head. He's got a king's garment, and he has a throne. At this point of his life, God still shows him mercy. And he comes in contact with the mercy of God. I said he comes in contact with the mercy of God. We're so thankful for the mercy of God. When David deserved to be the man, Nathan looked at him and said, you're the man, David. When he deserved, he didn't get what he deserved, but he got the mercy. And we find David in Psalms 51. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, for new a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. But restore to me, everybody say this with me, the joy of your salvation. Somewhere along the line, he had lost the joy of salvation. Somewhere along the line, caught up in this life of his, he lost the joy of the salvation. And when he comes in contact with the mercies of God, he cries out, oh God, create in me a clean heart. My spirit's not right. Renew a right spirit within me. If anything I ask for, you can take the kingdom away. Demote me, but don't take your presence from me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take your Holy Spirit from me. We see a man who knows what matters the most. And that's the presence of God. Lord, restore the joy of my salvation. There's something about the salvation that brings joy. I want to be a person that's not burnt out. I don't want to be a person that's so walked along with you that they've lost their joy for so many years. But God, allow my heart to be more on fire, more passionate, more in love with you, Jesus, today than the day I first met you. Restore the joy. Not going through the same old, same old, the routine. This is what I do. This is the way my parents did it. This is the way I've been raised. Or I'm just trying to make myself feel better on the start of it. No, I'm talking about joy. The joy of salvation. The strength of knowing that I've been saved. And more than my eternal security. A salvation for my right now and today. Salvation, nothing missing and nothing broken. Salvation of knowing that he's with me and that I'm not alone. That his presence can place a hedge of protection around me. That I'm untouchable to the enemy. Salvation where sickness and disease cannot come near my dwelling. Salvation. The joy, God, how could I forget or take for granted the price that you paid so that I could live in your salvation? Joy, God, when I look back upon the cross and see what you went through, it brings me joy to know that you love me so much. 
that brings us to the author of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1. Not just how we start, but how we end this year. How we live our life. The next couple weeks, you're going to hear from our children's ministry, our youth ministry, uh, our worship team on what's going through the year. As we enter into this year, being an answer, running our race with joy, with His presence in our life, and His kingdom unfolding before us. Verse 1, we're foreseeing, we're also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin, what does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The author and finisher of our faith. The one who knows the end from the beginning. That's why he can start this. That's why he penned my faith, my story. He knows the end from my beginning. That's why I can have hope in a hopeless situation. That's why I can run with joy, regardless of what I'm running through. That's why I know that this faith isn't just relied upon my own aspirations, but the author and finisher of my faith. Listen to this. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to hear me this morning. Jesus, well, like Paul, who was following in Jesus' steps, said, I don't count myself as dear, but I'm going to finish this race with joy. That's what Paul said. Jesus was able to endure everything that he went through. And he was able to do it because of joy. The joy that was set before him, despising the shame. Enduring the cross because of the heavenly commodity of joy. And as the worship team comes this morning, we find that Jesus was going through the most traumatic moment in history. And as he's being brought to the place of Golgotha, as he's being brought to this place of pain. He's able to do it with joy. For a couple things, what was set before him? He can endure the cross knowing that resurrection was just around the corner. I can endure my pain if I know that resurrection power is on the next page, in my next chapter, God has in store for me. If you're going through th- something painful, there is a resurrection. There is a resurrection for you if you have pain. Amen. There is joy for you. He says that for the tears of sorrow will reap and joy. God, I thank you that you showed us how to transition from one place to another. And you were able to look into it. And I don't know what you're, like I said, I don't know, maybe you had a good year, maybe you didn't. But if you're ready to transition into a new year, just as Jesus showed us, as he transitioned and during the cross into his resurrection and seated at the right hand of our Father, doing it with joy. God, we thank you, and we want to say we receive a year of joy, God. It's our heart's desire to be able to walk out these steps, to run this race with joy. As everybody stands, as we prepare for our first communion of the year, we prepare our hearts even now, O Lord. bring our sin, our shortcomings, our failures, and we lay them at your feet. And we say, God, thank you for your mercy. 
that you create in us a clean heart and you renew a right spirit. We thank you that you are God that encompasses us with your presence. Forgive us of our sins. We give and surrender our heart and our life to you. And we thank you for the strength and the joy to live for you all the days of our life. As pastors come, so we've prepared our hearts. He endured to transition. As we transition into this new year, may we do it with our eyes set upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. As we go, enduring with joy into our resurrection of a year of promises we've been believing for fulfilled, of a place that we are surrounded, that we experience His presence. And I thank you for the declaration of joy. A declaration of a year of joy for Gateway Family Church, of a year of joy for those at the sound of my voice. I declare a year of joy, hope, a tree of life, in Jesus' name. Pastor Greg, that was an excellent message. You know, when you said a door into the heart of God, and when you said that, it just, it just pierced my heart. And I saw a vision of me opening a door, and I saw a big heart inside the door, and it was God's heart. And I walked through the door, and I went into his heart. And I became so one with him. And I said, Lord, I want that. How do I get there? And he says, did you listen to the sermon? <laughs> yeah. So go through that door. Yeah. The Bible says that he took the cup. Well, let's do the bread first. I'll get it backwards. That he took the bread and he broke it. Break your bread. He said, take, eat, this is my body that was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me until I come again. It's the Lord's Supper. And let's take of the bread. And he took the cup. He said, this is a cup of the New Testament in my blood. It's in his very blood. The New Testament was brought to us. And we're people of the kingdom. We're people of the blood, the redeeming blood, the cleansing blood. And we plead the precious blood today. And we take of the cup. Bless this cup. Thank you, Lord, for enduring the cross. Thank you for saying yes to the cup of sufferings. Thank you. I want you to know this is not just a sermon. I want you to grab the hand of the person next to you this morning. And I make a decree, I declare here this morning, for a year of joy in your life. For a year of hope, restoration of joy, joy recreated, new joy, joy beyond belief, joy. I thank you for your presence, oh Lord, your presence in their life this year like none before. I thank you if the old things passed away. You're making all things new in their life. Yesterday's pain being gone. Yesterday's regrets being removed. 
But God, I thank you for a refreshing joy. I thank you for hope restored. And I thank you for the release of the joy of the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, would somebody give praise to a God who gives joy, to a God who releases joy to this day. Thank you for your mercy, oh God. If you're here this morning, you have any prayer requests, whether it's to surrender your heart to Jesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit, healing in your body. As a ministry team and pastors, make their way up here. We invite you to step out of your seats, make your way to the altar.